And I have uh, two o'clock. So if you'd like, uh, so we are recording now? Yes, we are. All right, let's begin. I'd like to call to order the Palm Beach County Transportation Disadvantaged Local Coordinating Board meeting today, Wednesday, October 28, 2020 at 2 p.m. Pursuant to the governor's executive order number 20-69 and TPA emergency order number 2020-04, the Palm Beach TPA is conducting the meeting, this meeting virtually using the Zoom webinar platform. Instruction to join this virtual meeting as well as contact information for assistance are provided in the published meeting agenda. Please note that although some members of the LCB are attending the meeting in person, LCB members will also be participating in today's meeting remotely, either via webcam or telephone. Additionally, scheduled presenters may be participating in person or remotely. Before we begin, I will summarize our public comment procedures for this virtual meeting. Written, comment, written comments may be submitted online at the website provided in the agenda. Verbal comments may be made by virtual attendee using the raise hand feature in the Zoom platform. Lastly, a verbal and or written comment may be provided by an in-person attendee submitting a comment card available at the welcome table. I will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Staff, may I please have a roll call? So I will ask that you unmute yourself. I will assist you in unmuting. If you're here on behalf of a board representative, if you can please identify that. Mayor Stephen Grant. Present. Tomas Boyan. Angela Choice. Present. Jeannie Christman. Present. Lisa Kramer. Hi, good afternoon, I'm here. Elsa DeGoy. Here. Marie Dorsman. Here. Thank you. Robert Goodman, Maria Hernandez, here, Robin Manuel, here, Angela Morlock, I'm sorry, Angela Morlock is excused, uh, David Rafaitis, present, Marlene Ramon, I'm here, good afternoon, Takesha Saffold, Laura Schultz, here. Mallory Sanat. Here. Nancy Arnell. Here. We have a quorum, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? Should to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and second to approve the agenda. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. I'm sorry. Aye. aye. Uh, I sorry, maker. Margie. What were you saying? I only have David as a motion maker. I don't. I, was, have a I believe it was uh, Elisa Kramer was uh, the yes. second. Yes. And, and if Mar you state your name after you make the motion. I would appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Um, so as we were in the middle, uh, we have a motion by uh, Mr. Refidatis and a second by Ms. Kramer. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Our next item is a motion to approve uh, the minutes for July 29, 2020. Does anyone have any revisions or may have a motion to approve? Jeannie motion Christman to approve. Motion. Jeannie Christman seconds the motion. Yeah. All right. I have a motion by Mr. Rafaitis, a second by uh, Ms. Crispin. Uh, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Is there anyone who opposes? I'm finished. Hearing none, the, the motion passes unanimously. Moving on to general public comments. 
Margie, do we have any comments from the public? No, Mr. Chair. All right. All right, moving on to comments from the chair and member comments. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like a long time, the, the three months since we've all joined together. So I hope everyone has been staying healthy. And, um, and with that, um, you know, I have no uh, really additional comments. I look forward to the, the presentation and probably will make some comments uh, before the end of the meeting. Is there? And Margie, would you, you, uh, you know, I think to, and so I'd like to see, you know, allow anybody to, to speak if they want to make comments now or at later when Margie makes uh, the roll call. So Margie, can you make the roll call and see if someone would like to speak now or later uh, okay. towards the end of the meeting? So Tomas Boyan, Angela Choice, and you will just need to unmute to provide your comments. Uh, Jeannie Crispin. Uh, I might make a comment later, but not now. Thank you. Alisa okay. Kramer. No comments at this time. Elsa DeGoy. Maria Hernandez. No comments at this time. Goodman, I don't believe, has joined us yet. Maria, uh, Maureen Dorsman. No comment at this time. Robin Manley. No comment at this time. David Rafaitis. No comment at this time. Marlene Ramdon. No comment at this time. I'll wait until later. Thank you. Takesha Saffold, I don't believe, has joined us. Uh, Laura Schultz. No comments right now. Thanks. Miller Sanat. No comments at this time. And Nancy Yarno. No comments at this time. Next, we have our liaison report. Uh, Alyssa. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, sorry about that. Um, it's really great to see everyone's faces again, even though it's virtual. I know it's been, um, like Mayor Grant was just saying, a long three months, but we have some great presentations for you guys. So um, first up is the liaisons report. Um, first thing on here is a TPA staff update. We are very excited to welcome Kelsey Peterson to the TPA as a transportation planner one on the uh, multimodal team for multimodal support. She's also going to be taking over the role as the LCB liaison, so that's very exciting. So do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Melissa mentioned, my name is Kelsey Peterson, and I joined the TPA about two weeks ago as the new Transportation Center 1 and LCB uh, liaison. Before this, I was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, finishing up my graduate degree in city and regional planning. Uh, but I'm excited to be in South Florida now, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks. So up next, we also have um, the uh, Commission for Transportation Disadvantage annual training. Um, staff, our staff attended the CTD annual workshop virtually October 6th through 8th of 2020. Um, during the TD Planners Roundtable, there was discussion of changing the CTC evaluation process. Changes are to be determined and will take effect in fiscal year 22, so that's next year. Additionally, Mobility Week 2020, um, FDOT is conduct conducting a statewide celebration of making smart, efficient, and safe transportation choices during Mobility Week, which is October 30th to November 6th. For additional information, visit the FDOT website. Safe Street Summit is coming up in January. Please save the date for the 2021 Summit. It will be held virtually on January 28th and 29th of 2020. More information is available on our website, safestreetsummit.org. We also have published our interactive comment map on our website um, and are collecting transportation-related concerns and suggestions via our new interactive comment map, and we invite you to um, go online and put some comments on there. It's available upon each tpa.org slash comment map. And then lastly, as always, LCB member presentations. We are always encouraging our members to come up and present. 
Um, if you are interested in presenting, please provide a five to 10 minute presentation on how your agency and everyday work relates to the transportation disadvantage and what we do at LCA. If you are interested in doing this, please reach out to Kelsey at kpeterson at palmbeachdpa.org. That is it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see any hands raised, Mr. Chair. All right. Our next is uh, our first action item, 2A, motion to approve the fiscal year 2018 to 22 transportation disadvantage service plan, fiscal year 21 annual update. TPA staff will present the fiscal year 21 annual update. The LCB is required to review, make recommendations, and approve minor updates to the TDSP annually. Uh, and a roll call vote will be required. And Alyssa, I believe you are presenting. Yes, I am. I hope I turn my mic on. So just as a reminder, this is a minor update for the Transportation Disadvantaged Service Plan. So the Transportation Disadvantage Service Plan is a document that requires a major update every five years and a minor update annually. This is just the annual update. Um, what is the Transportation Disadvantage Service Plan or TDSP? It's a tactical plan that is jointly developed between the DOPA uh, and the CTC. So that is the designated official plan agency and the community transportation coordinator. Um, this contains development, service, and quality assurance components, and is submitted to the CTD or commission for final action. So we're gonna go over some of the changes that you might have seen in the um, updated track changes document. First, for LCD membership, we included an updated roster. Um, two new members that we got in fiscal year 20 included area, or, uh, representative for Area Agency on Aging. So we welcome Nancy, Nancy Arnold in February of 2020. And then in July of 2019, we welcome Merlene Ramon on behalf of the local medical community. The 10 top trip generators changed between 2019 and 2020. In 2019, we had DARP Living and Learning Center on, but in 2020, that actually was removed from the list and replaced with OE dialysis. So the uh, comprehensive list of the 10 top trip generators is now on the screen. And number one is the Mid County Senior Center, Palm Beach Habilitation Center, North County Senior Center, Boca Hop Center, the RCTP, Palm Beach School for Autism, VA Medical Center, the OE dialysis, Gulfstream Goodwill Life Academy, and Mangonia, uh, Goodwill Mangonia Park. We also saw some changes in um, the needs assessment and the eligible riders. So in 2019, there were 38,725 eligible riders. That number actually increased over 1,000 in 2020. So we went up to 39,821 eligible riders. However, active riders decreased. So in 2019, we saw 15,400 active riders. But in 2020, we saw 11,006. Um, and average trips per CD rider was actually in 2019, 65 uh, trips on average per year and in 2020, 54. And part of this is because of the pandemic. Additional changes um, in regards to operations is the Go Glade Flex route um, was transitioned from the flex deviated service to a same day dialerized service that is operated in the Glaze region. And other uh, operations on this that change include there's now new holiday service on Labor Day and Independence Day. Previously, there were seven holidays that did not have any service, and now we're going to five. So there is still no holiday service on New Year's Day, Easter. No? Uh, every day. Okay, every day. That's wrong. So holiday service every day. Every day now, every day. Okay. And the Palm Tran app is available for smartphone users, and can, you can text 561-561 um, for text notifications on your route. 
The paratransit schedule also changed in 2019. It uh, from Mondays to Fridays, it was 4:50 a.m. to 10:50. The days actually got slightly longer, ending at 11 p.m. Saturday service stayed the same, 6 a.m. to 10:45 p.m. And then Sunday service got a little shorter. It was previously 7:15 a.m. to 8:15 p.m. and it's now 7:45 a.m. to 8 p.m. Additional changes include the uh, phase 2D fiscal year 2021 grievance procedures, which were approved at the quarter one meeting. The only updates to that were the dates. And that's it. If there are any questions on the updates. So, do you have a summary of the changes? Yes, the sum, well, so the presentation is the summary of the changes, and then they okay. were also all included in the um, backup. We had it okay. in track changes highlighted. All right. So I guess we'll move on to public comments first. Margie, are there any public comments? No, Mr. Chair, and I have that Elisa has her hand raised. Okay. So we'll start with you. Thank you all for um, for the report. It was um, a lot of good information in there. I just had a couple of questions uh, for clarification. The time frame for the largest trip generators and the eligible riders and all was that calendar year twenty twenty or is that fifteen? I mean, fiscal year nineteen twenty. So you. So yeah, it was not on the T calendar, which is July 1st, June 30th. Thank you. And then also, um, what are the routes 62 and 43 on um, in the um, report? There were oh, five that, routes that were highlighted as the most um, heavily used. Mm -hmm. 1, 2, 3, 62, and 43, and it explained what 1, 2, and 3 were. And I just wondered if. Um, those are the fixed routes. So those are the no, most. This one or here? No, here's the first one. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so for the record, Lou Ferry from Palm Tran. Uh, those were, uh, so what was on screen was the Palm Tran connection chip trip generators. So we also looked at the fixed routes the routes for the fixed route bus, the big bus. So those are the high, most highly uh, ridden fixed route buses. So the route one is along route one, Dixie. The two is Congress, three is military, uh, 43 is west, east and west. Um, and then there's a lake work for instance. So uh, those are just the fixed routes that, that, that generated the most. Maria, what are you and uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any other hands raised. I'm not sure if anyone else has any comments. All right. Uh, so if anyone would like to make comments now, if not, may I have a motion to approve. Elisa Kramer. Uh, so moved. And do we have a second? Second. Maybe do I one second? All right. So we have a, a first and a second. Um, Margie, may I have the roll call, please? And again. Okay. <coughs> and again, I won't call the roll, so you will need to unmute yourself. Um, and I will assist you as well. So, Mayor Graham. Present. Uh, yes. Sorry. Last Boynton. Angela Choice. Yes. Jeannie Christman. Jeannie, you need to unmute on your end. Okay, I'll come back. Elisa Kramer. Yes. Elsa DeGoy. Yes. Marie Dorsman. Yes. Robert Goodman. Absent from the vote. Maria Hernandez. Yes. Rob Emanuel. Yes. Angela Morlock. 
I'm sorry, I keep calling her, she's absent. Uh, David Rafaias. Uh, I would like to say, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, I would like to say yes, but uh, with a couple conditions. Number one, I think it's an awesome document. I think it has great information. I love the GIS maps, and it's definitely in sync with the health and human services element uh, that we're preparing, uh, as well as uh, a lot of the information that's uh, uh, involved with the community services department. So I just want to make sure that staff understands that it was, it's absolutely phenomenal to me. And I, I really like the thing about the transportation disadvantaged uh, uh, thing about subsidized paratransit trips and uh, how the funding formula was uh, uh, devised there. That, other, other than that, I'd like to say yes, I agree. And so we marked yes, yes. Merle Ramnon? Yes. Takesha Sapo? We marked as absent. Laura Schultz? Yes. Millery Sanat? Yes. Nancy Yarnell? Yes. And then to go back, Jean Christman? Yes. It passes unanimously, Mr. Chair. Okay, one more time, Margie. Sorry, it passes unanimously. All right, thank you so much. Our next item is a motion to appoint a representative to the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, uh, Americans with the Disabilities Act Advisory Committee. Uh, the SFRTA um, ADA Advisory Committee is an advisory committee to the SFRTA Governing Board that addresses disability issues in the Tri-County area as it relates to Tri-Rail. SFRTA is requesting that Palm Beach County LCB to designate a representative to serve on this committee. There is no backup for this item. And so, oh, we do have, is there another slide? Yes, so I do have a presentation. It's very brief and there was no actual backup for this item, so that's correct. Okay. Um, So I want to do a quick overview of the SFRTA ADA Advisory Committee. It is an advisory committee to South Florida Regional Transportation Authority's Governing Board um, and addresses ADA issues in the Tri-County area, so Palm Beach County, Broward County, and Miami-Dade County relating to Tri-Rail. Um, SFRTA is the body that does operate Tri-Rail. Um, so, currently, the committee is made up of members from each of the three counties. There's an ADA coordinator, an LCB member, an LCB liaison, and someone from one of the operating uh, transit companies. Um, so, we are currently looking to fill the vacant position of an LCB member, and we are looking to take nominations. I'm going to take this off the screen so we can see you guys raising hands. and. Um, if you have any additional questions on it, we can answer them because he is uh, on the board. Okay. Chair. 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 Yes. All right. So do we have any nominations? If I may just chair, I know that yep. each of staff has uh, uh, expressed interest in this in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's why we actually brought this up because we needed someone to fill this for a while. And no one really stepped up to that to say they wanted to do it. For okay. A while. So I know she's not on the call, but I know she'll she would definitely be upset if we don't put a program in. Okay. Oh, well, thank you for that. And uh, and I guess Lou, she's the one that uh, helped put this on the agenda. Yeah. So we actually, I'm sorry to interject. Um, we did hear from Angie Morlock also about interest in this um, after seeing the agenda. So. Okay. So the, the question is, I think this is the first time I've heard of uh, this appoint, appointment available. And when is their next meeting? We had a meeting actually last month, so it's not for another think, two months. So it'll be sometime in uh, December? Either December or January, yeah. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of where I like to, you know, since we do have two people um, to that, I'll ask the board to, to pick one 
and that we continue to have this item on the, the agenda for the next meeting. And so that hopefully one of them will be able to attend and that way we can pick the person because we don't necessarily want to pick somebody that isn't attending meetings. So alternatively, when we were in communications with SFRTA, they did tell us that we can have an alternate. So we can appoint one to be the main member and then one to be the alternate. All right. That's the end here. I, 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 and, I may share. So uh, Angela Swimbach was on the board for, geez, I don't know, 15 years. So she is very familiar with it. OK. She, she should be new to it. So, so for me, um, based upon your comments, it's kind of like, let's have the, the new person um, to try it out because Angela has been on it for so long. And, you know, if someone is willing to try to do it, you know, I, that's kind of how I got into politics. And so that's why I think, um, like I mentioned, um, I'll take, uh, you know, for the board for the nominations, but, uh, you know, I'd be, you know, remiss if we don't let Ms. Staffold have that opportunity um, based upon your, um, comments of her willingness to be on that board and that we have a discussion hopefully with both of them at our next LCB meeting. But I'll still need the board to issue a, a motion or a nomination because you two cannot nominate. <laughs> so uh, Margie, if you don't mind unmuting so we can get someone to speak. Um, ask all to unmute. And if we don't get uh, someone to speak, we will have it at our next meeting. So Chair, I have asked all to unmute. Um, I don't have any hands raised and they need to unmute on their end as well. Okay. Uh, in order to make a nomination. Alisa, I see you raising your hand. You are unmuted, so you're welcome to speak. Hi, thank you. I just, um, I don't uh, know either of the nominees very well. And so perhaps if at the next meeting, if they could um, mm -hmm. speak about their interest um, and then one could be nominated to serve and one as the alternate, um, I think it's it's great if we have two people interested and we have a slot for one and an alternate, you know, I'm glad for either or both to represent the board. Um, I just don't know, you know, if one might actually, since there's someone else interested, if one would be willing to back down or <laughs> I don't know who feels more strongly or who has the greater interest. So I, I just feel at a loss to really nominate, but. Um, so the the other reason why I would mention Ms. Uh, Staffold's name is I believe she was on the LCB board longer mm. as Ms. Morlock has, I believe got uh, appointed on last year. So that's why, you know, it's, it's up to the, the board to make a decision today that we can revisit. Um, but if we don't make a decision today, there will be no one at the, the FSFRTA meeting in December. So, oh. Back in February. So our next meeting is in February. Yes, the next meeting is February twenty fourth. Okay, so it's most likely they'll miss December, January, and February. They'll probably. Okay, sorry. Yeah, they'll probably miss a couple of meetings, but if the presentation, that, you know, to give them both a chance to speak. Angela was actually a representative on this board as a NPO member, or it would be TPA now. So she was uh, on that for ever. And then yeah. she would be representing someone that rides the service and also the local uh, the LCB. So that's the difference between, I guess, both of their interests. So Angela's just going to go back into it and, and then be involved in it again. And then uh, Takeshi would just try it. But to, to have, allow them to speak and let us know what their desire is probably a good idea. So we, we've had a vacancy for a long time, so it's okay. If we, okay. So thank you, though. Appreciate it. All right. 
So, Chair, as a point of order, if I can have a motion to defer this to the February meeting, and then we'll bring it back. Okay. So, receiving no nominations, uh, may I have a motion to table till the, the next LCB meeting? Ms. Jeannie Christman, I'll motion that we table it to the next LCB meeting. This is also a second. All right. And so I have a motion to table and a second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Um, next item, we have our informational items, uh, community transportation coordinator update. And I'll invite uh, Lou Freire, Palm Tran Connection Manager, to present this item. All right, thank you, everyone. I'm going to be on the board soon. So uh, this update is from the CTC, or you know, really what is Palm Tran, for those that are kind of new to the board. Uh, so it's, it can be pretty extensive. So I'll go through some things. Um, Mr. Chair, do you want me to uh, stop for questions, or do you want to do the questions after? Um, because it's virtual, let's uh, stop, uh, wait for questions afterwards and give everyone an opportunity to speak. All right, we got it. Thank you. So uh, a quick update of what's been going on. The last time we spoke, we were kind of really, really in this pandemic, and, and things have changed since then. Uh, but just to do a little overview of what we, we've done and what's changed. So the facial coverings and the masks are still required to ride all of our modes, so Palm Tran and Palm Tran Connection. The fixed route is on an enhanced Saturday schedule with regular boarding and the lighting practices, which means during the pandemic, we had uh, a limited service out there. Uh, we, we ramped that up to get people to work as things were opening. People, uh, our riders are really saying we need, to, we, we need to get to work, we need to get where we need to go. So we have an enhanced Saturday schedule. But those main routes that we talked about earlier have uh, longer hours. And then during the pandemic, we only boarded through the rear. Now we are uh, boarding and alighting just as usual, just as pre-COVID. Uh, fares on fixed route, go blades, and connection were reinstituted on August 16th of this year. The number of people on board fixed route has been limited to no more than 20 passengers, and that's going to stay that way for a little while. The go blades service continues to operate as a dial ride system in which the rider can call and get a direct trip to their destination. So we spoke of that a little earlier. And on the connection service, Palm Train Connection is providing regular service. There's no, nothing limited. Uh, the OTP has actually averaged over 95%. However, that affected our passengers per hour. So as a door-to-door -door transportation service, what you want to do is you want to try and multi-load as much as possible. Well, of course, during this time, we really don't want to multi-load very much. So we do not want to have more than one passenger per hour. But we, we are, as, as everything opened up and went into that extra, that, that other phase, um, we are averaging close to 2,000 passengers per weekday now, which means we do have to multi-load. So if we have to multi-load, we actually socially distance and limit the riders and the vehicles. What that means is we have a six passenger ambulatory two wheelchair chair vehicle. Now that turns into a two and one. Instead of a six and two, we'll have two passengers and one wheelchair or a 12 passenger Two wheelchair vehicle would be like a four and one. So we're spacing, spacing our, uh, our riders out. Uh, we delivered over 6,000 meals to seniors in need of meals. So uh, during this pandemic, uh, we also wanted to make sure the, that the providers were made as whole as possible, so to speak, as well as the drivers working. Because, uh, you know, Amazon is still out there, everybody's buying stuff. They're taking drivers here and there. We had to make sure that we at least guaranteed them like six hours on the road to keep these drivers that we trained um, and keep them on our payroll and within our system. Because if not, when these numbers came up back, I think last I reported, we were at about 800 to almost 1,200 trips a day. Now we're going up to 2,000. We need these drivers. So we kept them working by doing different things. As I said, delivering meals to seniors. We also transported uh, uh, homeless people from uh, the uh, uh, the uh, what is the park over there? Uh, the park in West Palm Beach to um, the annex. Also uh, trying to, to to just help them out too. Anything that was needed, we try to find uh, extra things for our drivers to do. 
So the amount of the routes on the road is about 75% of the rate of the daily total to achieve that social distancing and keep those drivers working. The other activities are the buses are thoroughly cleaned every night and periodically throughout the day at predetermined locations uh, by an outside vendor. So we are still paying someone to go out there and, and certify clean, cleaning the fixed route buses and the connection buses throughout the day. Uh, masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, they've all been distributed to frontline workers. Uh, we actually distributed over 100,000 masks to the public on fixed route and on connection uh, during the height of the pandemic. Uh, daily temperature checks and when possible employees are working remotely internally for Palm Tran and also our providers are doing that too. So when that driver arrives, uh, they actually get their uh, temperature taken and they have to answer those questions to make sure that they're, uh, they're healthy. Now, I'm gonna knock on what I don't know if this is another quote or not, but I can tell you that it's an amazing feat. It's an amazing thing that there's not one driver or one passenger that has contracted COVID by riding our service. If a driver got it or someone got it, it was because of their social circumstances, not because they rode our service. Uh, I know that for the connection side, your job is a little bit harder because we don't know who their riders are. But on the connection side, we, we follow the protocols. Um, I have to give big credit to our providers and First Transit and Genie with NV. Uh, we're making sure the drivers are safe and in turn, our passengers are safe. Uh, Connection efficiency project, we can talk about that a little bit long, more if you want to, but uh, on December, I'm sorry, on October 20th, um, the eligibility phone interviews were passed and also the reservation scheduling from seven days out to three days out was approved by the Board of County Commissioners. We had a public hearing. So the other initiatives from that uh, connection efficiency project that I brought to you previously were to look at a possible overflow, which would be Uber, Lyft, something like that. Well, obviously, we don't need that right now, so we're going to incorporate that in our new RFP for, for service, which is going to be in 2022 when that's when that new service starts, meaning our new paratransit contract. And then the other one is to look at the ADA area. Right now, we have a very large core area, and we will be just looking at how to manage that a little bit better. But those two things are, are postponed until uh, spring of 2021. And then uh, these initiatives are looking to be implemented in November. Other activities and statistics uh, we want to bring forward. Mr. Goodman isn't at this meeting, he's on at the last, but I do want to keep saying that we did change some stuff to bus route 91 at his request and added two new stops at 13th Street and Meadows Road. Um, hopefully, you can see these pictures the installation of the bus operator doors and Q train securing system on fixed routes. This is a really cool thing that happened. Uh, the, the bus operator doors is really a door on the fixed route bus that actually protects the driver from pretty much everything, but from the, from the public coming in and out of the bus. We had this in initiative actually uh, set up to go in before COVID hit. And the reason why is up in Tampa uh, last year, or maybe a year and a half ago, up in Tampa, a driver was actually um, a rider who was mentally off, came up and, and cut the driver and killed him. So that was up in Tampa. And the initiative here in Palm Beach County was that we were going to put these doors in to, uh, for better safety for our drivers. And now, obviously, it's worked even better because it, it gets that other protection to the driver from those that are coming in and paying with the fare boxes. So you can see the first two pictures. That's our, uh, our county administrator, Rodini Baker. We kind of call him the Rodini Baker, Ms. Baker's bus operator doors. And um, then the, thing on the, the, the one on the right is the Q strain securement system. So this is also kind of an amazing thing that we use actually with the CARE Act money that we got for COVID. So what this is, instead of the operator having to stop over their door now, get out and secure the wheelchair, um, the wheelchair user can actually back in and then that little arm comes down and goes against their uh, wheelchair and it secures them on their own. They just press the button and um, it's, it's an incredible thing. So we also are installing UV lights. They're installed within the air conditioning unit to kill they say kill pretty much everything. Um, and back to that holiday service, we have rides every day of the year. I think the, uh, that presentation we had was the only two that we did so far this year were those two. And maybe we can get to the other uh, um, holidays. But yes, we, this is pretty momentous in the year in Palm Beach County because it didn't make sense that we had seven days throughout the year that people couldn't go out and do things. So now we ride every day of the year. And um, just reminding everyone next week, so free transit on election day. So Tuesday, November 3rd, on all of our modes, which is Go Blades, Fixed Trout, 
and connection are free. So that's pretty cool. So each uh, meeting I was asked to make sure we include something about TD ridership and a complaint report. So this would be that report right now. So uh, the TD ridership in June was 4,296 riders with zero complaints. And these complaints are concerns. So anyone that calls in, we consider it a complaint until we then validate it. So we had zero in June. In July, 4,613 trips, three TD complaints, and, we, and none of them were valid. August, 4,417 trips with five complaints and two that we validated. And September, 5,342 with six complaints and three validated. Those other complaints were uh, in the categories of speeding, late pickup, no assistance, and other, which could be just that you know, they might not have been wearing masks or they might have been on the phone, things like that. So move on to the next one. So I thought these would be interesting to show. So as you can see, November 19th, in November 2019 was before this pandemic, and we were at about 81,000 uh, trips. This is overall, not just TD. Uh, December, we were at 80,000. January, up to 88. February, 85. And then it just started dipping. 60,000, down to 27,000 in April, 34, 44. And then it you know, rose up to 48, and uh, it was 44,000 in August. So that just gives you an idea of what it's looked like for us as far as trans uh, passengers that have been transported. Uh, by month. So if we go back to the other one, the previous slide, you can see TD ridership is about 4,200, 4,600, the high of 5,300 in September. So September, um, we have a little bit higher ridership this year uh, as well, with about 45,000 trips. And the next one is the new clients registered. So also, as you can see, we averaged about 367, close to 400. 360, 383, 395 in March, new registered customers, and then it just dipped down to 321, 209, down to 165 in June, 169, and 163 in August. We're seeing a little uptick, but still, it's 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 a little tough. People still aren't coming out. It's mostly the riders that uh, that just need service or have to go to doctor's appointments and things like that. And then our on-time performance, as you can see, this is something that actually pandemic affected in a positive way. Uh, but in November 2019, we were at 81%, 83%, 81%, 79%. Now you'll see our goal, our industry standard is actually 92%. So we were well below that. And for those that might be new, the reasons why we just had so many trips and not enough resources. So now having all of these vehicles out there and keeping the drivers working, we actually have uh, more service out there so we can actually meet their demands. So as it went up to 85%, 98% in April, 98, 97, 97, 96. And now we're about 95 because again, we have those 2,000 uh, riders a day. And the last one here is the passengers per service by month. Again, as I said, we want to be at that 1.58, 1.53, somewhere at that 1.5, but boom, it dipped down in April all the way down to 0.86, which means we have less than one person on a vehicle. Uh, up to one and just hovering around a little over one uh, passenger per hour on uh, on that. Now, again, the passengers per service hour it affects our bottom line and it's, it, it, it is why we want more people on the vehicles to control their costs, but at this time it's just not a priority, obviously. So this next slide I'm gonna um, defer to to the director of uh, admin services for Comtran, Jeremy Baker, who should be online if you can Unmute him, maybe. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Mr. Chair. So, um, per your request, we put together some information about the transportation disadvantage grant that comes from the state of Florida. Um, what they do is provide subsidized uh, paratransit trips and also subsidized uh, daily and monthly bus passes for individuals. Um, we looked at the last three years. And these run on a state fiscal year, so July 1 to June 30th. Um, the numbers are there, but basically it's a six to seven million dollar a year program. The state's giving us about 3.8 million dollars. The county is required to match it at 10 percent, but we, uh, the county has consistently provided um, all the funding necessary to maintain the program. Uh, the last few years have also been very inconsistent with regards to the funding we're getting from the state. Um, 2018 to 2019, there was a temporary formula that they were allocating the funds out on. 
uh, 2019 to 2020, they went back to an old formula that was based in statutory language. Uh, this created a lot of hardships for a number of agencies throughout the state um, and caused the um, Transportation Disadvantage uh, Commission to go back and provide additional funding um, to try to make up for that loss of funding based on this uh, statutory formula. And then again, we also ran into the COVID-19. Where are we at for 2020 to 2021 fiscal years, we're still on the modified statutory formula and what the uh, CTD is looking for in the 21 to 22 timeframe is to change the statutory language to redo the funding model. So we're not really certain where that's going to end. Uh, the one thing that has been consistent throughout all of these years is the county has um, put in the funding to allow the program to remain whole. So there have not been any um, changes or decreases to the services provided based on variations in the funding provided by the CTD. So, Mike, I'm, so just begin to look at this real quick. Um, the second line there, transportation disadvantage grants. So we get that grant from a trust fund. And as you can see, our required match is only 10%. But historically here in Palm Beach County, we overmatch it, as Jeremy said, to make sure the program meets the needs of the, of the residents here in Palm Beach County. So as you can see, we overmatch this by an incredible amount. And uh, as far as I know, we are the only county to match it at this level. Some overmatch that 10%, but not at this level. So the next slide, I'm just gonna go real quick to the next slide, and I know you guys are gonna have some questions, but I really wanna uh, give us some, uh, some kudos for some good things we're doing, and that's recognizing our employees. So throughout this pandemic, we heard about frontline uh, workers and you know the nurses and, and the medical industry is, is is very important, but also our operators and our maintenance guys and all of us that are doing what we're doing is also important because again, I always say this, but transportation is the hinge which upon everything turns on. If you don't have the transportation, people can't access things. So we were out there during the height of the pandemic. We were out there on the buses, uh, driving those buses up and down our roads, reversing through them to get people where they needed to go. Uh, we transported people that were COVID positive. We were transporting people that we didn't know if they were COVID positive. We we, we were just there. We were there for our community. So we actually have a bus that you might see around the county, Palm Beach County, that looks just like that picture. And it's called Frontline Faces Taking You Places. And it's a bus rack. And you have a picture out, uh, a couple of picture out drivers, operators there. Uh, you have some maintenance workers. And on the other side of the bus, which I don't have a picture of, we actually have a, a, an operator from MV and First Transit. So the power transit side is represented as well, of Oakley's drivers. And, and so this is a really cool thing. And we had some pictures taken last week, um, also next to our uh, our Susan Coleman uh, pink bus, which is also a really cool thing. Uh, we also gave our, our, our transit employees transit hero pins. And another interesting thing the county did, which is pretty awesome, is for those employees that actually were in the office or on those buses, at least 80% of uh, their working week actually got comp time. So uh, the bargaining unit, which is which is the ATU, they got comp time for, for the work that they they were out there um, working. So we actually gave them comp time that they can use for vacation to kind of take off now that um, they need that break. And for the uh, administrative employees as well. So that's a that's a pretty cool thing that, that Palm Beach County and, and Palm Transit did. So that concludes this portion, Mr. Chair. So I'll just stop now and we can go back if there's any specific questions about this one before going to the next part of the Thank you. And so, um, Marge, I'll ask you if uh, to request anybody to unmute if they have any questions for Lou. Um, and just for the record, Mr. Chair, I don't have any public comments um, so far, but I do have that Nancy, your now has her hand raised. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Yarnell, would you like to begin? Yes, um, I just want to thank Lou and Mr. Yarnell for your efforts in allowed them to shelter in place and stay safe and we received a lot of phone calls from them about how important it was so i just want to thank you for that all right is there any other uh, comments 
or questions? I have uh, Jeannie with her hand raised. I just want to thank uh, Palm Tran and Lou as well for keeping my drivers working. They support families and uh, the hardworking, dedicated people. And I, I really appreciate all Palm Beach County and, and Lou is doing to keep my drivers working. And uh, I also want to state, I think our drivers and our working environment is probably much safer than like going into a Walmart because we do do so much PPE the gloves, the sanitizer, the cleaning the buses, the temperature taken every morning. Um, during this entire time, I've had three drivers that did come down with COVID. None of them were very ill, thank goodness. But uh, that's very few drivers when you look at how many drivers we have. I have 260 employees. So um, as bad as it is, it would be so much worse if it wasn't for Palm Beach County and Palm Tran and their efforts to keep our drivers going. Thank you. And yes, I see uh, Laura with your hand raised. I just wanted to also say thank you on behalf of our students who were continuing to be able to get to their jobs. We have a lot of our students in our postgraduate programs. They've completed their diploma and they were able to keep going to work throughout all of this. And we really appreciate your buses keeping going. All right, thank you, Laura. And is there anyone else that has comments? I don't see any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. All right. All right, well, and Lou, you said you had uh, additional? Yes, the second part of the um, presentation is the CTC evaluation update. So that's something you guys did earlier this year. Um, you evaluated us as a CTC. Uh, there were some members from the board that took part in that. And I don't know if you want me to, it's pretty lengthy, so I don't know if there's just, does anyone have any questions about the, the, the findings and the responses that we gave, or uh, I'm at your, your back and call, so you let me know what you want me to do. Um, yeah, so I know that, so you have the slides as part of the backup? Yes. Let's run through the, let's run through the slides. And then if someone has any questions on them. Um, I'll just go through one and then we can just stop. And see. Yeah, if you just want to just go over anything you think is special on the key findings and uh, we'll go from there, you know, and that way we'll go through the slides that way. You got it. So that first one really is the complaint process bringing into the LCP. So again, we, we brought those uh, ridership numbers and through the CTC review brought some of those complaint numbers to you guys. Uh, this next one. All right, so um, this is just about finding and trying to coordinate more with the fixed route and tri rail and transfers and things like that. So we are actually hiring an outreach coordinator that's going to help with this, and they're going to be actually tasked to hold trainings and workshops for customers transitioning from paratransit to fixed route. This has been something we, we, we've always wanted for a long time, and we were able to get into the budget this coming year for an outreach coordinator so we can get out there and they can be out there. Uh, at the Century Villages and places, well, they might not be out there right now, but they will be out there, I'm confident, or whatever way we need to, but just to educate the public about um, Palm Train Connection, and that Palm Train Connection might not be the only means of transportation, and do some travel training. Uh, so we're, we're very uh, happy about that initiative, and also, we also have our PT Stack team, which is a Palm Train um, team that is, that is organized and is actually out there to increase ridership. And they're out there thinking of ways to get those choice riders on on fixed route, which is what we always want as well. So we, we are moving forward with that initiative. So that's a good thing for this funding. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right. So the next one was uh, make sure it's, it's up there. Um, Fifty three ten. So the fifty three ten re 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 recipients. Um, we do not have coordinated contracts right now. So. This is kind of a, a bigger thing. Um, Mr. Chair, if you want us to bring this to you at a, at a later date, it might be better to bring that to you. Um, just a quick review would be that Palm Beach County is actually the only county in all of Florida that do not have coordinated contracts with uh, those that received this 5310 uh, grant. And the reason why was our, our county just was not comfortable in taking the responsibility of 
inspecting vehicles and making sure that whoever runs these vehicles in our county uh, are safe and everything like that. And we we then look at those uh, the results of those inspections, and sometimes they're not very good. And in the past, we weren't sure if FDOT was going to take away the vehicles or if the TV commission was going to be intervened. So it's been a very confusing process for us to try and get these coordinated contracts. Now, we did have a proposal a couple of years ago through Marie, or maybe we can bring back now, because I know we do have a new county attorney um, for Palm Tram, which we can we can brief him about what this is about, and maybe we can bring this back at a later date. So that's what, that's what I'd like to talk about there. So. Um, okay. Next one would be uh, school buses. Again, every year this comes up, and this is just a TV uh, recommendation, and it's just we can't do here. Uh, school buses are just not a feasible option in this county in the way that we provide power transit service. So it's just something we've tried in the past, and we just can't use the school buses in, in our service. And the next one is the IBR, the uh, IBR. So the past web is available 24 seven for trip inquiries. IBR information is taken directly from the client file and the rider's eligibility file. So I think through the process when you, when, when some of the LCB members were talking to the riders, they were saying that sometimes the information is wrong. Um, well, if the IBR is wrong, it's because it's taken from whatever they gave us in our certification. So we also need to put the onus on the actual riders to give us the correct information when they book a trip, when they sign up for us, and things like that. But as far as checking their trips, we actually have that pass web, which they can go online, and they can check where the bus is 15 minutes before their window, and they can actually watch that bus coming to their to their house or wherever they're getting picked up. So it's pretty cool and, and it's worked pretty well. Uh, so the next one would be TV service is not available on seven holidays. Well, guess what? Now it is, so that's a good thing. So very happy about that one. Next one is uh, currently, again, this is just an old thing that used to be in the, in the, in the statutes that, you know, or we're not, we don't currently have an official arrangement with the local wages coalition or, or career source. Um, however, we feel as we, that was a, we do work with them as much as possible. Uh, we provide trips through connection and fixture routes to those seeking employment. Um, we talk to career source a lot. Um, we actually reinstated a, a bus stop outside their facility that was taken, taken away through the RPM. So we try and work with them as best as possible. But to have an actual arrangement with them that's, that's like a, an interlocal agreement with them. We had one way back in like 2000, 2003, and it was more or less they just wanted us to provide free bus passes, which is not really a cooperation is just kind of, we want some free bus passes. So we feel as though we do work with them, and work well with them. The next one is local standards. So there's a lot of things in here, but I'll just read our response. The CTC, we're constantly monitoring all aspects of the transportation. Uh, we provide, as you can see with some of the statistics and the graphs that I showed earlier today, um, the connection sufficiency project, which I spoke of before, is that strategic plan that was pretty much recommended in this finding. So we're currently in the process of implementing that first phase of that eligibility phone interview, and then we're moving from seven days to three days out um, with the bookings, and that's going to help that no-show and cancel rate that we had. So that was pretty big. Uh, let's see, let's, uh, next one, there you go. And the IBR system has real-time feature enabled for a call when the vehicle arrives. So we have that, plus we also, they, uh, the riders can also call our uh, where's my ride line uh, whenever we're open. Um, and the one recommendation is the drivers are not permitted actually to call the client, so the riders can use that password I talked about before. So um, we don't allow the drivers to actually call, call, the, call them. However, we do have something right now, which we implemented was when the driver actually arrives and presses the arrive button, a, an automated phone call through that IVR goes out to tell the passenger that that vehicle is there. So we actually added that. And the customers can purchase the tickets to ride so they don't have to carry the exact change. We do. Um, have something that hopefully we can be implemented in uh, 2021, uh, which would be cashless fares. Um, it's just, it's a little bit more of an update than we thought. We have to upgrade our software and there's a whole bunch of different hurdles we have, but we are in, in the midst of trying to get that implemented as well. So for that, Mr. Chair, that's, that's the uh, CTC evaluation update. If anyone has any questions, specific questions about these. All right, Margie, do you see any hand raise? Uh, I have Nancy with her hand raised again, and I wanted to know, I just want to make sure that there's no members from the public with public comments. 
and that during this presentation, Robert Goodman did join us. Okay. Thank you. So Nancy, would you like to begin? Um, yeah, about um, the tickets to ride. Um, Lou, do they have to go to Palm Tran? And can you tell me a little more about what you're talking about in 2021 for the cashless fare? Sure. So right now, uh, you can purchase the tickets to ride in our office at 15 Minute Military Trail, South Military Trail, right there on uh, Gun Club and Military. Or uh, they can actually pull the form off our website and send in a check right now to order those tickets to ride. They come in a book, it, a book of 10, so it's $35 for 10 tickets. So they can do that either way. We do not have means for, for them to do it by credit card right now. Um, we've been fighting with the county's uh, uh, county clerk to try and figure out how to do that. But right now, uh, the credit card machine that we have in the office only allows us to, to swipe the credit card and not put the information in any other way. I know that sounds crazy in 2020, almost 2021. But um, that's what it is for the tickets to ride. So they can pay by exact change, $3.50, or buy the tickets to ride. Now, what we're looking for later on is a system where you can take a credit card, you can put $35 in your account, so to speak, and then when, the, when you book the trip and take the trip, it's automatically taken off your account, almost like an Uber or a Lyft, something like that. Your, Thank you. Software. Margie, anyone else with their hand raised? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. All right. And um, I know that I had a conversation with uh, Alyssa last week regarding, I think, uh, the budget for the Palm Tran connection. Do we have that information? We don't Jeremy? Have yeah, Jeremy can answer that question. Mayor Grant, we put that information together. Um, Clinton wanted to sit and talk with us before we had an opportunity to sit down and talk to you about it. Okay. Um, that that's the answer then. Thank you. All right. And is there any other questions from? Sorry, did just raise her hand. Who? I'm sorry. Uh, can you say their name again? Elsa Dubois has her hand raised. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to say, Lou. Um, it is a pleasure working with uh, Palm Tran, Palm Tran Connect, and Lou Ferry. It, and if we can somehow straighten our partnership and make it even stronger, and we can brainstorm in the future offline how we can continue serving our client population and your writers further, I am very open to that. And I know you are too. So I just wanted to say thank you for all we've been able to do up to now. And those buses, bus passes you gave us, our clients, were, it helped our clients tremendously. So thank you so much. Thank you. And seeing no more uh, comments or questions, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology. Uh, staff from FAST will provide, it, provide an overview of the programs offered and technologies available to individuals needing assistive technology. And uh, do we have a presentation? We yes, should we get up on the screen now, and then we have a presenter to give control to. I'm able to control it? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm not sure how much time we have at this point. Um, we got about uh, 20, you know, 20 more minutes, so. Wow. Okay, good, good. I'll try to be brief, fast, and concise. No pun intended with fast. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm sure you... Many of you may know already about the Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology, um, or FAST, um, but I just wanted to come in and, and thankfully remind you of how this can still be a resource to any Floridian, a free resource to any Floridian who may benefit from any assistive technology tool. Um, we are currently, or you know, it's a state resource, but our South Florida office, which would serve Palm Beach County as well is located at the University of Miami at this point, but all our services, oops, how do I go back? Let me see, there. Um, all our services now do obviously to COVID are being done or conducted remotely. 
Uh, they include assistive technology demonstrations. So I could meet with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis or group of individuals to learn about how uh, an IT tool can benefit them in their daily lives. Uh, we do trainings. And then one of, mo of our most popular programs is a device lending library. So we house different technologies, whether they, they're items for communication, for accessing computer, um, for using smart tech, and this technology can be shipped for free to anyone in Florida, including return shipping label for 30 days for the purpose of trialing the AT in your own environment, um, home, office, school. So just to know that this is free and it's a resource to anyone that would like to, to participate. I wanted to uh, use this time. Obviously I can't uh, be there and show you the AT personally, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what is AT, but I just wanted to reiterate that it can be anything, whether you customize it yourself or something that is more highly skilled or um, that is going to help an individual be as independent as possible in a given task. Um, I embedded in this presentation some products that um, are available in our lending library. So after today, at the end of the presentation, I, have, I share my contact information, so feel free to utilize it yourself or to share it with anyone who you think could benefit from being either trained or uh, on any of these tools or borrow some of this technology themselves from our lending library. Um, I included items here that uh, can facilitate daily living, so things that can help us be more independent in opening jars, you know, uh, cutting boards, whether there is anything that can help an individual become uh, able to cook and do any activity that anyone will be able to do on their own. Um, I wanted to highlight technology now that is also available in our um, own devices. We tend to neglect that, um, you know, most of us already own smartphones or tablets, and there's a lot of accessibility features that are already embedded in these types of devices that can help facilitate reading, voice dictation, um, even the ability to control your device. And if need, individuals needed to learn more about how to set up these um, accessibility features in their own uh, own smart technologies, they could even contact our office for that type of support. So it's not all, only about the acquisition of um, AT, it's about understanding how to use maybe what you already have to benefit you. And this is just um, in here an example of um, a feature on an iPhone or an iOS device where you can unclutter a web page. So it would remove all the extra pictures and make the same text bigger or enlarge it if vision were a difficulty or reading were a difficulty. Just an example. I'm going fast, but I apologize. Any questions at the end, feel free to ask. Um, I had here some videos. I'm not sure I might be able to show them because I don't want to take too much time. Um, I can share my presentation with anyone at the end and you might be able to view them, but I was highlighting here uh, Minimax, which is a portable um, magnifier that you can take with you. So if, for example, you're shopping and you want to look at tags or how something costs, you can, you know, make things closer and uh, enlarge them to your benefit. I included here a LiveScribe pen which is basically a writing assistant tool. It's a, it's a pen, literally a pen, that will also record a session. So you don't feel like you have to keep up with the writing. It will record the, the session and you might be able to you know, plug it in with USB and transcribe it. And then I highlighted an app called Tap Tap C, which is free and it's a neat app. It allows you to take a snapshot with your, the iPhone camera of any, any, any item. Uh, if you have visual difficulties, for example, and can't really clearly see something, it will actually describe the item that you took a picture of. Um, and, I, and, and if you have the presentation at the end, you will be able to see those videos with more ease. Um, I included items here that can help manage, you know, medication, uh, manage our time, doctor's appointments. These are all things that, you know, facilitate our lives. So there are multiple devices and apps that are available for this type of, of, of need. 
Um, this is an example of another daily um, tool uh, where, whereas if you have a phone that like you can't remember phone numbers or, you know, there's a need to, you can put pictures to identify who you want to call, make it easier or accessible for either a senior or someone with cognitive difficulties to remember who and when to call. I have examples here of assisted li uh, listening devices. So, you know, the listening to TVs are difficult or hard. There are items that can help with that. So, you know, someone will be able to listen to their own TV without bothering everyone around them if they found it too loud. And um, I wanted to highlight uh, what is already part of our lives, mostly uh, our Alexas and Nest and Echoes. These become almost like um, environmental control units, you know, we are able now to, you know, put a, a, a using an example, an Amazon Echo, and um, if you purchase uh, light bulbs that are compatible or thermostats that are compatible, someone with a mobility difficulty would be able to virtually control their environment using an item as common as an Alexa. So we have all these items for trial and we have all these items to help or facilitate an individual the opportunity to know how to use them. Okay, um, this is just a picture of our, uh, uh, not a big picture, but a little picture of our lab with some of the devices that we have available. Again, we're located at the University of Miami, but as I mentioned, we're able to ship, this is for the South Florida office, the state office is in Tallahassee. But anyone that wants to contact us and learn a little bit more about how can FAST assist you or someone you know, um, feel free to uh, grab my information, email me, call me, visit our website at www.faast.org um, and we would be able to facilitate that for you. Any questions? So um, I'll start off with the, the questions. If we, so in order to borrow something, we do need to go down to Miami. Is that correct? We can ship items. You don't okay. need to, um, There is the state offices in Tallahassee, and then we have six regional centers across the entire state. And it mm -hmm. just will happen. And then, yes, for South Florida, it's in Miami. Yes. But we're able now, thanks, you know, not thanks, but because of COVID, we yeah. have adjusted to offering a lot of our services now virtually and okay. shipping. So technically, you don't really even need to come to our office. OK, excellent. And so um, I know that we have uh, an ADA coordinator in my city. And so I'll definitely get them in touch with you so that we can uh, get this information and hopefully schedule you know, another virtual presentation so that more of a the residents here in South Florida know exactly what FAST is and how helpful it can be. Um, and I'll ask Alyssa to email us your presentation. Yes, please. And that way we can look at the videos at our leisure and have all of your information. Yes, thank you. And I'll open it up to the, the board if they have any questions or, you know, give Anna a little heads up that you'd like to contact her in the future. And if not, we'll, I think that was, uh, no, we have one more of partner agency updates. Chair, just for the record, I'm sorry, there are no public comments on this item. Okay, does anyone have their hand raised? I don't see any hands raised, I just wanna make sure. Okay. No, I don't see any hands raised. No worries. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And then next are, is our partner agency updates. No, we are not expecting any today. All right. And then moving forward, we will have uh, our next meeting on February 24, 2021. And we do intend in-person meetings uh, is what it says. Um, unless the governor changes or extends permission to conduct virtual meetings. Thank you for your patience with us as we conducted this virtual board meeting today at this time. Uh, may I have a, a motion to adjourn? Oh, I, and uh, as I stated before, is that if any of the, the board members would like to make final comments before we end the meeting. So um, Margie, um, I'll, I'll go first in the sense is that, uh, you know, I look forward to Palm Tran, you know, giving us the, you know, we got the total numbers of the revenue received 
uh, from the palm train, but it's kind of like, how does that break down so that we can figure out or make recommendations to palm train or the county, how best to utilize those funds. Um, because one of the things that I, I was speaking with Jeremy is that should we start trying to invest funds for telemedicine or other types of internet services so that we can make, um, you know, so that we can use our tax um, taxes wisely. And those were my comments. Mayor Grant, if I could respond yeah. to that for just a moment. Uh, this is a conversation we had internally, and one of the things that we wanted to clarify is that the LCB, uh, and Luke can correct me if I misstate this, but the LCB is primarily focused on the transportation disadvantaged grant and not the broader paratransit. That might be a better conversation to have through the uh, service board. Okay. But again, we're open to that conversation at whatever level it needs to be. Okay, and and I, I absolutely I can understand it. the The issue is is that we we don't oversee just the LCB um, here. We see uh, the county match as well, and so that's kind of where my um, you know information is is that it's not just you know if we're only looking at the LB LCB money, then that's something that we should only see. But we see the total aspect of Palm Tran connection. So I don't know if that's something that you're planning on limiting this board from doing in the future, looking at the total funding received from Palm Tran, uh, from the county to Palm Tran connection. I'll just be clear, that's not my intention. And uh, no, 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 no Jeremy, this is Jeremy. Yeah, this isn't for you to answer. This is for Clinton to answer. Hopefully next time he'll, he'll be in February. Uh, hopefully you'll have an answer far before February. Okay, thank you. Mayor, so, would you like me to call a roll? Yes, please. And I will assist you with unmuting, but you will need to unmute on your side. Um, so I don't believe Tomas Boynton joined us. So Angela Choice. No, I don't have any. Jeannie Christman. No further comments. Lisa Kramer. Just uh, thank you to Lou and Margie and Alyssa and the whole team for all of the information that you all provided in advance for us to review and put together. Thank you. Marie Dorsten. Just um, thank you for uh, to Palm Train for providing the senior meals. I know we received a lot of calls and um, the seniors were very happy. And also thank you for providing uh, transportation services during the difficult time. Thank you so much. Elsa DeCoy. No further comments, just thank you and stay safe everyone. <laughs> Robert Goodman. Yeah, I hope so. Yes, that's good. No, I mean, it's been asked yeah. about it. Mayor Hernandez? No further comments. Robin Manuel? David Arpaitis? Marlene Ramnon? Yes, I just want to say thanks to all of you for the great work that you're doing and um, to Palm Tran and all the transportation um, groups that are providing services to the community. But I do have a question or a comment, whatever way you wanna take it. I pretty much um, work with also the Florida Institute for Health Innovation. And um, one of the goal of this um, institution is looking at fetal infant mortality and looking at ways that we can decrease fetal infant mortality in our county. Um, I'm looking at one of the objectives that we have or the recommendations that we're looking at cultural competence in health equity. And so that goes in line with our maternity clients and our postpartum clients. You know, very often they are referred from the health department, which is the 45th Street location, to Ripic St. Mary's. And um, I know the bus service, um, that's bus 31, the bus route. 
um, it's not going into St. Mary's. And so the clients, they have to pretty much either walk from the, um, the clinics to St. Mary's, and we talk about pregnant women and so on and so forth, and with you know so many babies too. So I am not sure or I'm not privy to the information how this service from the health department to St. Mary's was discontinued and wanted to see if there's any plans for the bus service to be there from that location, the clinic to St. Mary's. So that's my concern and my questions or my issues. Thank you. Yes. So um, if I may, I think I also have someone online uh, from our planning department, but actually St. Mary's asked us to leave. We would have continued to uh, provide service inside of St. Mary's and have the bus in there, but they asked us to remove the bus from that area. So they wouldn't allow us to go into their property anymore. So we had to make that change. If Yash is on, is that correct? He's here. We can give him permission. Oh. Um. Hey, good afternoon. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. So, yes, we made um, we the Route 31 change. We made that as part of RPM. That was about uh, almost kind of two years ago. And we can simulate the service and check what are going to be, what's going to be the difference in operating cost to go back in there or go near it. And then we can get back to you. If you can leave me your email ID or any other information. Thank you. That would be appreciated going nearby. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes different entities that are owned by, well, not the county, decide that they don't want a big picture of bus coming in there or waiting. And, and, and uh, we had that with Century Village down in Boca. They took the bus away, so our buses are no longer coming into Century Village. Uh, so the choice that they made that they actually used to pay money for the buses that come into to Century Village now that no longer going to do that. So sometimes, um, just like VA, VA doesn't want the buses in there anymore either. So sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a hard fight for us as public transportation to try and make sure our customers can access it at an easy point. But sometimes the malls, like as I've been here for almost 19 years now, the malls just keep pushing us further and further away from the malls. We used to just pull up right in front of the mall. So, uh, these are some of the things that, that, that are a struggle for us. I'll try and find them. Mayor Grant? Yes. I have a question. Have about, a question. Uh, he just mentioned he just that mentioned this is being taken away from Century Village and Boca. Um, I'm going to try to find out why and what's going to happen to the people that live on Lions Road that depend on that bus. So yeah, if you can speak with the the association because that's the uh, the person uh, the entity that makes those decisions. So the bus is still going to go on Lions Road. It's just not going to go inside Century Village. It's going to go up on Lions Road, then go on New England Boulevard, and um, then go up Street or Seven Yamato, and then back on Lions. So everyone on Lions Road is still going to get the service. The bus is just not going to go inside Century Village. And I believe for the people that are inside Century Village they are still trying to access it, their personal bus or trolley or whatever they have is still going to get them from wherever they are inside the community to the gate. And from there, they can still access Route 91. So they'll be able to get on the bus at the gate. And you said it's going to go Lions to Yamada to 441? Correct. And then you and the water first. Sounds reasonable. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Margie, it seems you're muted. Thank you. Sorry, we were trying to deal with the echo we were getting. Um, I don't know if Merlene had completed her comments. Yes, thank you. I did complete my comment. You know, um, I would appreciate anything close by St. Mary's would be good. We can't, as um, Mayor um, 
Grant just said, you know, they are you know, challenging and we can go against um, organizations or associations, so we have to do it. But if we could have something close by, you know, that would um, you know, our clients you know, can get the needed service. You know, because just for example, a lot of our clients, they don't have transportation and they have to walk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I did want to circle back to David Rapidus. He got disconnected when I called his name and he rejoined. David, do you have any comments you would like to make? I believe he's trying to unmute. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the question was. Do you have, do you have any? Do you have any final comments uh, before we adjourn the meeting? Uh, no, I've been trying to. <laughs> I've been trying to work off of three computers to uh, attend the meeting, uh, so it's been a little complicated. So I'm working off my iPhone, off a laptop, and off my desktop. And uh, um, I'm not sure what happened, but I've had IT people over here, so I apologize. You know, uh, I uh, haven't been able to participate as much as usual, but sorry. But everything else is fine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Takesha Saffold doesn't look like she's joined. Lauren Schultz. Just it is nice to see everybody. Be well. Um, Valerie Sahan. It's nice to see everybody. Can't wait to have a live meeting. Thank you. And Nancy Arnell. No comments. Have a good evening. And so that was it uh, for the board. Thank you. And so now I'll have uh, the, the meeting is adjourned. Um, and do I have a closing statement? Um, no, Mr. Chair, you already read it, that our next meeting we do intend to hold in person at our office. All right. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe. <laughs>